Today we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 22. We're going to begin in the first verse and read almost all of the chapter. What we're looking at is Paul's defense before the mob that has attacked him at the temple in Jerusalem. Hello, my name is Dr. James Jones. I'm the pastor of the DeRitter Presbyterian Church in DeRitter, Louisiana, and the First Reformed Presbyterian Church Mission of Moss Bluff, Louisiana. Glad that you're with us today. Hear now the Word of God from Acts chapter 22, beginning to read at verse number 1. Brethren and fathers, hear my defense which I now offer to you. And when they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew dialect, they became even more quiet. And he said, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated under Gamaliel, strictly according to the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, just as you all are today. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and putting both men and women into prisons as also the high priest and all the council of the elders can testify. From them I also received letters to the brethren and started off for Damascus in order to bring even those who were there to Jerusalem as prisoners to be punished. But it happened that as I was on my way approaching Damascus about noontime, a very bright light suddenly flashed from heaven all around me, and I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus the Nazarene, whom you are persecuting. And those who were with me saw the light, to be sure, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Get up and go on into Damascus, and there you will be told of all that has been appointed for you to do. But since I could not see because of the brightness of that light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me and came into Damascus. A certain Ananias, a man who was devout by the standard of the law and well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me and standing near said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very time I looked up at him. And he said, The God of our fathers has appointed you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear an utterance from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to all men of what you have seen and heard. Now, why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. It happened when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple that I fell into a trance. And I saw him saying to me, Make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly, because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves understand that in one synagogue after another, I used to imprison and beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of your witness Stephen was being shed, I also was standing by approving and watching out for the coats of those who were slaying him. And he said to me, Go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. They listened to him up to this statement, and then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. And as they were crying out and throwing off their cloaks and tossing dust into the air, the commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks, stating that he should be examined by scourging so that he might find out the reason why they were shouting against him that way. But when they stretched him out with thongs, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? When the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and told him, saying, What are you about to do? For this man is a Roman. The commander came and said to him, Tell me, are you a Roman? And he said, Yes. The commander answered, I acquired this citizenship with a large sum of money. And Paul said, but I was actually born a citizen. Therefore, those who were about to examine him immediately let go of him. And the commander also was afraid when he found out that he was a Roman and because he had put him in chains. This is the word of God. May the Lord add his rich blessings to our reading and hearing and understanding of his holy word. Amen. Let us pray. 
Almighty and gracious God, we pray now that the Holy Spirit would be our guide and teacher, that He would open the Word of God and that He would instruct us from it today, that He would engrave it upon our hearts and souls and change us and conform us more and more into the image of Christ, Your Son, our great Savior and King. We ask these things in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. The Apostle Paul has been accused of speaking against the Jewish people, of speaking against the law of God and against the temple there in Jerusalem. A mob has attacked him, uh, and in addition to all of that, he was accused of bringing Gentiles into the temple to defile the holy place. And so Paul, having been rescued by the Roman cohort there in uh, Jerusalem at the fortress Antonia, uh, has asked for permission from the uh, commander of the cohort to speak to the crowd. And the commander has granted him permission. And in Acts chapter 22, uh, we read Paul's defense before the crowd, in which he not only defends himself, but he defends the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, those accusations that have been made, he uh, defends by simply talking about his life prior to his conversion, what he was like as a Jew growing up, uh, studying in Jerusalem, uh, his uh, zeal for the law of God, his persecution of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, and then his conversion and his subsequent call to be missionary to the Gentiles. And so as we begin looking at this, Paul talks to the crowd in Hebrew, the Hebrew dialect, actually Aramaic here, uh, which was the spoken language that the people used in those days. Uh, as Paul addresses this crowd in their native tongue, they quiet down, they begin to listen to what he has to say. And so he begins, first of all, to describe who he is. He names himself as a, a Jew from the city of uh, Tarsus in Cilicia, that that was where he was born, but he was brought to Jerusalem and he was trained under the uh, auspices of Gamaliel. Now, we've seen Gamaliel earlier in the book of Acts. Gamaliel was a Pharisee. Uh, he was a leader of a sect of the Pharisees that were more moderate in their approach to uh, the application of the law toward society uh, in general. Uh, there were some of them much more radical than he was. He's the one that... Uh, that uh, exercised caution and, and promoted caution in dealing with Peter and James when they were arrested by the Sanhedrin. Uh, he said, basically, as we saw back then, uh, that if uh, the Sanhedrin took uh, issue with James and Peter, and then it was discovered that God had spoken with them, that the Sanhedrin would find itself uh, fighting against God. And so his recommendation was wait and see. Wait and see. If this is of man, it will fall completely apart. If it's of God, there's nothing you can do, but you're fighting against God. So it was this Gamaliel under whom uh, the Apostle Paul as Saul of Tarsus was trained. He became very zealous. Uh, it's obviously true that any disciple of Gamaliel would be zealous for the law of God, but Paul points out his particular zeal as he speaks of the fact that uh, as a younger man he began to persecute the church. Uh, he persecuted this way, as it's called, which was uh, the, a, a term for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, Christianity, before it was known by that particular term. Uh, that he persecuted this way, and he persecuted men and women to death, that uh, he uh, uses that particular term. And then he also talks about how uh, he arrested both men and women and uh, threw them into prison. And so Paul was so zealous for what he saw to be a proper understanding of the law of God uh, that he asked for and received letters of recommendation and official authority to leave Jerusalem and to go to Damascus and to hunt down and arrest Christians in that city and drag them back to Jerusalem to stand trial. And so this was Paul's uh, remark about this. He basically says to the crowd, I was as zealous for the law as you are this very day. And so he points out his Jewishness. He'd been accused of hating his people. And here in his own defense, he describes how prior to his conversion, 
Uh, he was a very zealous Jew. He held the law in high regard. He did not speak against the law, but he saw the law as very important, and he sought to persecute those who themselves rejected the law of God. And then he moves on and uh, begins to talk about what took place on the Damascus Road that we've read about earlier in the book of Acts. Uh, Paul says that as he was approaching Damascus around noontime when the sun was shining brightly overhead, suddenly a brighter light appeared in the sky. And it, uh, the, the power of the glory of this light drove Paul to the ground. And he heard a voice speaking to him. The voice addressed him directly and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Uh, Saul recognized this in his native language. Uh, he was stunned by the glory of this light that he saw. And so he, he cries out, Who are you, Lord? He recognizes this is God. But why would God be speaking to Saul about persecuting him when Saul was on a mission for God? Saul was, uh, he thought, traveling to Damascus uh, as a servant of God to hunt down those who were blasphemers of God, those who were Christians. And so he couldn't quite reconcile in his own mind how God could say, you are persecuting me. And so he says, who are you? And this is when he receives that reply, I am Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the Nazarene, whom you are persecuting. This must have been an entire shock to Paul to suddenly come face to face with the risen Lord Jesus Christ, the one he thought was dead, the one he thought was an imposter, the one he thought was a blasphemer, who now is speaking to him from heaven as God himself. Paul had to have been incredibly stunned. And so he asks a question here that Luke does not record in that prior chapter where he describes uh, Paul's conversion. In that earlier chapter, it was Luke's de uh, description of what took place. This is Paul's own words for what took place. He says that at this point, he asked, what would you have me to do? Uh, what should I do, Lord? Uh, he was... He was completely flummoxed. He had no clue where to go or what to do at this point. And so the, the risen Lord Jesus Christ tells him, get up and go on into Damascus and await further instructions. But what Paul discovered, uh, he sa tells the crowd, was that when he opened his eyes and tried to stand, he couldn't see. The glory of God had blinded him and he was unable to see. And so he had to be taken by the hand uh, of those who were traveling with him and led into the city of Damascus. And then Paul goes on at that point and begins to describe what happened following this, how God had sent Ananias. Uh, now, we read earlier about Ananias being hesitant. Uh, Paul doesn't know about that or doesn't mention that here. And Ananias comes to him and says to him, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus has sent me, receive your sight. And so at that moment, just by those very words, uh, suddenly Paul is able to see. He says, I looked up at him. And so God healed Paul's vision through using this servant, Ananias, who had been sent to speak to Paul. And now Paul is about to receive instructions as to what he is to do. And so uh, this man, oh, incidentally, this man Ananias is spoken of as being a devout Jew who is held in high regard by all the Jews in the city of Damascus. And so Paul wanted uh, these folks to understand that uh, if they needed to ask someone about his credentials, they could go to Ananias. He was well respected uh, among those of that city, and he could tell them about the Apostle Paul. And so uh, Paul is now instructed by Ananias, who says to him, uh, the God of our fathers has appointed you. And then he tells him three things that God has appointed him. Uh, he has appointed you to know his will, to uh, see the righteous one, and to hear an utterance from his mouth. And then as a result of that, Paul is to be a witness to all men of the things that he has seen and that he has heard. 
And so uh, he has been instructed that he will know the will of God. He will see God's righteous one, and he will hear an utterance from the mouth of God's righteous one, the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Those three things are indeed uh, talking about Paul's encounter with Christ on the Damascus Road. Now, Paul came to know, he, he was to know the will of God. What Paul came to know about the will of God was that the one whom he had been persecuting as a false prophet was actually the Messiah spoken of in the Old Testament Scriptures. Uh, he had uh, come to know now that he had been in the wrong in persecuting Christians because they were truly followers of the risen Lord Jesus Christ, whom he has now encountered. And he came to know that this Jesus that he thought was dead and gone is alive and is indeed God. And so Paul's whole world is shaken. Everything's taken out from under his feet at this particular point. He has come to know that the will of God was the opposite of what he thought it was. The second thing he learns is he has been granted by the God of our fathers, as Ananias says, the God of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to see the righteous one. Now, that's a particular term that's used, and I think uh, Paul is thinking about the passage in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 11, uh, where we're told this, As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, as he will bear their iniquities. And so in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 11, Jesus is called the righteous one. And here Paul is given a vision of the righteous one. He is granted by God to see the righteous one spoken of in the prophet Isaiah and fulfilled by the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, the one who gives His life a ransom for many, the one indeed who will justify many uh, by uh, bearing their iniquities, as Isaiah prophesied. And so uh, Paul came to know Christ as the righteous one of God uh, foretold in Isaiah the prophet. Uh, and then Paul heard an utterance from Jesus' own mouth. Jesus addressed him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Jesus then commanded him, go into Damascus and you will receive further instructions. And now Ananias has been sent to him with those further instructions. And finally, he is instructed, because of all of these things that he has uh, gone through, he is instructed now to be God's witness for Christ to all men. And so Paul is laying the groundwork so that this crowd in Jerusalem will understand why he does what he does and why he proclaims what he proclaims about the Lord Jesus Christ. That God has told him to be a witness to all men. That God has set him apart for this particular uh, calling. And then Ananias says, what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins calling upon His name. Now, the washing away of sins is not related to the baptism. Baptism is a picture of that. But the washing away of sins comes through calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the way in which it's laid out here in the original language. And so uh, we need to understand that, that water baptism is a sign and a seal and a symbol but that water itself does not convey these things. It is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ calling upon His name that causes Paul to be washed from his sins by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul then describes what happens to him as he returns to Jerusalem from Damascus. He skips over uh, events that we've read about earlier in uh, Damascus that took place there, he comes to what's important, and that is he went to the temple in Jerusalem and began to pray. This is something that Luke does not record anyplace else. This is the first we hear of this. And while he was in the temple at Jerusalem, while he was praying to God, Jesus appeared to him. Paul fell into a trance 
And there, the risen Lord Jesus Christ tells the Apostle Paul that he is to go and leave the city of Jerusalem because the people will not receive his testimony about Christ. This stuns Paul because he knows he's been called to be a good witness. And he says, he tries to argue with the Lord Jesus at this particular point. He says, but Lord, uh, these people know how I used to persecute you. And they know how I used to hunt down and imprison uh, folks who believe in you. And they know how I even stood by and approved of the killing of Stephen, your witness, and held the coats for those who were murdering him. Surely this is going to, the implication is, surely this is going to give me some credibility with the crowd that now they can see the change that you have brought about in my life by uh, seeing you, the risen Lord Jesus, by my now telling them that you are indeed not a false prophet, but the true Messiah of God. That's all the implication of what Paul is saying here to Jesus, but Jesus stops him. And Jesus tells him, no, you're to go. Uh, you are uh, not to stay. You are to leave the city. I am sending you far away to the Gentiles. And so this was indeed Paul's true calling. He was the missionary to the Gentiles. Paul has brought all of this up to that point to explain to the crowd in Jerusalem why he does what he does and what he proclaims. Now up until this very point, he has shown that he has been a true Jew. He has shown that he has great respect for the law of God. And he has shown that he has great respect for the temple, for he went to the temple to pray. But all of that is swept aside the second he says, Jesus sent me away to the Gentiles. Uh, the crowd becomes apoplectic at this point. They blow up. They begin to tear their clothes or throw their clothes off so that they can begin to pick up stones to stone him. They toss dust up in the air, which was a, a Jewish way of rejecting what was being said and the person who was saying it. And they begin to cry out for Paul's death. Uh, this was uh, probably to have been expected, uh, and yet it is a, a great shock, this, this reaction that takes place. And so as this goes on, the Roman uh, cohort is standing there along with Paul at the top of the stairs and all of a sudden uh, they see the crowd erupt like this. Now recall these Romans most likely and, and the uh, commander of the Roman army, Claudius Lysias, most likely do not understand and do not speak Aramaic. And so this has been done in a foreign language. Everything rocked along just fine for a while. It seemed like it was a nice uh, speech. And then suddenly the crowd erupts. And the commander wonders, what has this man said to this crowd? Uh, and so he grabs him and says, we're going to haul him into the barracks and we are going to subject him to enhanced uh, interrogation, uh, interrogation methods. Uh, they're going to scourge him. He's preparing to be flogged. Now, scourging in those days was a horrible, horrible form of interrogation or punishment. Uh, it was basically done with a, a long uh, leather whip with several ends, uh, several cords to the end of it. And on those cords were attached pieces of bone or pieces of rock or pieces of metal. And when a person was scourged on his back, uh, those uh, uh, projections would tear uh, hunks of skin out. People were known to have died from severe flogging, severe scourging. And so Paul is about to be scourged by the Roman army. He's stretched out on the rack. Uh, his hands and his feet are tied down with leather thongs. And he turns to the centurion who is in charge of his beating and uh, he asked him, is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? Now, as soon as the centurion hears this, he probably turns as white as a sheet because this is a terrible crime. You see, being a Roman citizen in those days was a very important thing. And most, most of these Roman soldiers were not citizens of the empire. They were, they were uh, slaves, they were servants, they, uh, they served at the whim of uh, the emperor and, and others and the senate and so forth. But they themselves, many of them were not 
actually citizens. And therefore, citizens of the Roman Empire held a very high position of honor. A citizen of Rome could not be arrested uh, and uh, beaten without charges being laid against him and a defense being given of those charges. Uh, a, a citizen of Rome could not be executed in some ways that common criminals could. For example, crucifixion was barred from being used to kill a Roman citizen. And so scourging like this was an impossibility. It could not be done to a Roman citizen. And a Roman citizen had a right as a Roman citizen to demand a trial back in Italy rather than in the provinces like Jerusalem. And so all of these things are surrounding Paul's simple question, is it, is it lawful for you to do what you're about to do? I'm a Roman and I am uncondemned. And so no trial's been held. He's about to be beaten. He's been arrested uh, illegally. And uh, this causes the centurion to immediately run to the commander and say to the commander, what are you about to do? Now, this is not a rebuke of the commander. This is his own terror talking to the commander about why the commander needs to be terrified. This man's a Roman. Do you not know that? And so the commander immediately hurries down to where Paul uh, has been uh, laid out on the rack to be beaten. And he interrogates him by asking, are you a Roman? Meaning, are you a Roman citizen? And Paul answers, yes, I am. And so the commander says, I too am a Roman citizen. I bought my citizenship with a great deal of money. And probably what uh, Claudius Lysias is thinking is uh, this man does not appear to be the type of person who has a lot of money and would be able to do this. And so maybe he's lying to me. And lying about Roman citizenship brought the death penalty. And so he wants to get to the bottom of this right away. If he is a citizen, that's one condition. But if he's lying about being a citizen, uh, his, his neck's on the chopping block almost immediately. Paul says, uh, no, I am a natural born citizen of Rome. And this terrifies all of the soldiers. Notice they immediately back away from the Apostle Paul, like, what are we about to do? They realize that they have, up to this point, been engaged in something that is highly illegal. And so they back away from Paul, scared of the consequences of what they have been about to do. Uh, they let him go. They untie him. And they're afraid of suffering the consequences. Now, uh, think about this for just a minute. Paul continues as he addressed both the commander, we saw at the end of the last chapter very respectfully, but very boldly, asking for permission to address the crowd. Paul continues to uh, do the same thing as he addresses the centurion. He doesn't cry or scream or, or threaten or blaspheme or anything like that when he's stretched out on the rack. He just asks, is it lawful for you to do what you're about to do? And so uh, it, his calm demeanor and his boldness and his insistence upon his Roman citizenship that all culminate in the terror that falls upon this Roman cohort and their leader, Claudius Lysias. They are scared to death. Uh, what Paul is, is doing here is he is willing, we know, he's, he's already said, we saw earlier, he has said, I am willing to suffer. I am willing even to die for the Lord Jesus. But one thing Paul wants to do is to make sure that if that happens, it happens lawfully. It happens legally. And so Paul is going to hold his captors accountable before their own law for following their own system of justice. He's not going to let them get away with treating him in some unjust, illegal way when he as a citizen has certain rights. Now, I mentioned last week in the, in the sermon that uh, we have to be very careful that we are bold and that we are also calm in our demeanor when we address those who are in positions of, for example, civil authority over us, that it's an important witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. At the same time, and I also mentioned that, that you shouldn't be screaming about your rights. 
That's not what Paul's doing. He's not screaming about his rights, but he's insisting upon his rights. And so uh, we can do exactly the same thing. Uh, We can and should, by the example of the Apostle Paul given here, insist that those who uh, would seek to in some way uh, treat the church unlawfully be held accountable for their unlawful actions. Uh, that they cannot simply get away with something because they consider themselves to be in a position of authority, that they are under the law just as all of us are under the law. So Paul insists that these uh, leaders of the army act in a lawful fashion toward him in his arrest and in his trial. Uh, we Let's apply this unfortunately, to our own day. Uh, Because of the current pandemic, uh, there are petty uh, leaders of various places, mayors and governors and others, uh, who are exercising a heavy-handed or steel-booted form of authoritarianism over everyone that is under their jurisdiction, and in particular, the church. And so I want to address how it's being handled by some toward the church. There are those who are making threats, saying that the church will not reopen until I say so, or the church will be shut down for this, that, and the other, and uh, trying to uh, demand a list of members of a church so that we can know who can go and who cannot. All of this is totally contrary to our American system of government and the freedom that our forefathers handed to us. And so we can stand as the Apostle Paul stood upon, he stood upon the truth of the Word of God and he stood upon his Roman citizenship and demanded lawful treatment We as Christians today need to stand upon our American citizenship and demand lawful treatment from any authority that would seek to do an illegal thing, like demand membership roles of churches, demand that churches be shut, or things like that. That We cannot open the door for such folks to uh, be allowed to begin to dictate to the church. This is uh, a clear separation of the authority that they have that does not extend to the church of Jesus Christ. There is only one king and head of the church, and that's the Lord Jesus. He is the one that tells us what we are to do. So that's the first thing. Uh, But remember, as you address those leaders, you should do so in the same way that the Apostle Paul did, respectfully and yet boldly in the Lord Jesus Christ. But even more important, I think, than your citizenship on earth is your citizenship in the kingdom of heaven. And so as a Christian, you are to be like the Apostle Paul in showing even to enemies the reason that you have for your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul was willing to stand before those who were trying to kill him and give his defense of his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and to seek to convince them that Christ is not a false prophet. He is the Messiah spoken of in the Old Testament. He is the righteous one of Almighty God. He is the one with whom we all have to do. And so our citizenship in heaven is of greater import than our citizenship on earth no matter what country we are born in and what country we live in. And so uh, you and I have not seen with our physical eyes or heard with our physical ears the risen Lord Jesus Christ, but we read about Him in Holy Scripture. And as we read about Him, we have a similar type of encounter. We indeed can know the will of God just as Paul did. Uh, Not by direct revelation, but by reading the Word of God and seeing the will of God set forth for us in Scripture. We have seen the righteous one of God in the pages of the Word of God, both in Isaiah 53 and throughout all the New Testament and throughout all the Bible, we see Jesus as the righteous one who indeed takes away our sin by the sacrifice that He gave of Himself upon the cross. 
And so we know the righteous one of God because God has opened our eyes to see and unstopped our ears to hear and given us hearts to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We know him. And finally, we have heard the utterance of Christ, not with physical ears, but in reading the pages of the scriptures, we see Jesus speaking to us and giving us the commands of the way in which we are to live our lives, all the days of our lives, for his honor and for his glory. And so Christian, we have a similar calling to that of Paul. We are to be witnesses to all men of the things that we have seen and heard from the pages of the word of God. We are to declare to them God's holy will, which is that all men are to repent of their sins and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ by faith. Uh, We are to show them the holy and righteous one of God and to speak about how he took the sins of all of God's elect upon himself and bore our guilt and bore our punishment and the wrath of Almighty God that fell upon him in our place. And that we have heard the utterance of the Lord Jesus Christ commanding us to go forth and live for Him and to serve for Christ and to tell others of our great Savior, the Lord Jesus. And so friend, as you're listening today, has that been your experience? Have you come to know the will of God, which is repentance and faith in Jesus? Have you come to see the righteous one of God, Jesus Christ, who was lifted up upon the cross, who bled and died in the place of his people and took our guilt and who grants to us his holy righteousness? And indeed, have you heard the utterance of the Lord Jesus Christ commanding you to now go forth and serve him as a witness all the days of your life? If you have not, Do so today. Trust in Him. Trust in Christ. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank You so much for the work of Jesus, our Savior. We thank You for this ministry that Paul was granted by Your grace. And we pray now that You would bless us to live for Christ all the days of our lives, to serve Him openly and wholeheartedly. Please forgive our sins. Please bless us to be Your godly people living godly lives in the midst of a sinful, fallen, and wicked world. We pray these things in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Thank you for being with me today, and I look forward to bringing the Word of God again next Lord's Day.